Okay. Um, sorry. Um, but the interesting thing is while we suffer with Christ, we're actually sharing in his glory. If we really recognize that the cross was his glory, was his great triumph, then we're joining him there. We're joining him through the door that passes into the new kingdom and joining him into a blessed new reality that it changes into. <laughs> We're joining him in the new life. As a result, we find we live in the blessed reality that we're sharing through that suffering. But an interesting thing that happens, and I've experienced this a few times in my life, again, I'm growing in it, but um, is that we actually find when we're suffering with Christ, when we're suffering for the things that are truly good to pass them on, they become less burdensome. They actually become more freeing. <coughs> they don't have to have that weightiness that we're used to. Because in some ways, we find that release that you so often talk about, Katie, that rest. Suffering for others becomes a mean of, means of grace and knowing Christ and knowing him in our midst and knowing and experience that closeness and that holiness. It's again, what I couldn't quite get to in all of it, but that idea of um, experiencing his kingdom while being in the brokenness. Can we dig into a little bit Please. about suffering for being a Christian, like suffering with Christ? Yeah. What does that look like? Or what has that looked like? Because for mm. me, I haven't, I'm trying to connect it, but that hasn't been my life experience. Mm. So, I mean, I know there are missionaries out there who are getting killed, but sort of in our day-to-day -day life, how, how do people feel? Mm -hmm. how, how do you suffer? Because, mm -hmm. yeah, so. I, don't know. I think there's numerous ways we can. Yeah. Um, so I think there's the grand, grander ways that we can recognize like martyrs right. or, or those that are really cast out of societies and that sort of thing for becoming Christians. You can, you know, look at any is a Muslim that um, becomes Christian. Oftentimes, almost every time I've heard of, they are actually cast out of their family. Oh. Um, Imagine I became Christian and my parents exiled. Totally. That would be crazy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but even if we're not taking the extreme examples, mm -hmm. there is a way in which as we become Christian, we fit less and less. Right. right. I, like I experience this quite often in my life is I don't feel like I belong in all the same things. I don't care the same amount about so many different things out in the world. And I'll hang out with people that talk about sports or video games or whatever. And I'll be like, yeah, that's great. <laughs> I love it. Um, but yeah, it's not, can yeah. we talk about God? <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. like, can we talk oh, about yeah, a way I, forward? I like sports yeah, yeah. 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 Like, I have a change the channel or something else. Mm -hmm. yeah. But I welcome that rejection now. It's like mm -hmm. God's redirection, God's oh, protection. Right. Mm -hmm. I feel that the more I'm coming into my faith, the less and less people are in my path. Mm -hmm. And I just, I just, I'm happy. I've just been pulled in too many different directions. Yes. Um, and it's so nice to be able to focus on God's will for me. Totally. Yeah. And that's the interesting thing about not belonging, but belonging. Because <laughs> it's it's kind of like we're persecuted by the world, but at the same thing time Jesus talks about in the, the Sermon on um, the Beatitudes is yours is the kingdom of heaven. Yours is the kingdom of heaven. At the same time, you're not belonging in the world. At the same time, you're experiencing otherness in the world. You're experiencing real belongingness, a place where you really fit, where you have purpose. And because it's the kingdom of God, it, it, you don't have to push. It's not striving for anything. It's living. I get a little bit of this suffering when I go to my sister's place because mm. they live a very different life. And mm -hmm. it's, um, they have like a poker night uh, on Saturday evenings. And I went one time and yeah, it really felt like I used to play poker a lot when I was younger, but 
I felt really out of place. Like, mm. like I didn't belong, and I was mm-hmm. just kind of going through the motions, and just like they're making these jokes, and I'm like, you know, being part of the boys, but like not really. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we just don't talk the same way. We can't talk the same way. Mm-hmm. Like we can't joke about the same things. Like yeah, yeah. And it's not that we've like we found less joy in it. We've actually found more joy. <laughs> right. And we want we'd rather have that. Um right. and we find these other things often just uh, at least I'm speaking for myself more than anything. Yeah. These other things just detract mm-hmm. so often. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um yeah. but yeah, it is it is just sort of finding our place. Mm-hmm. And I think one of the other parts of it is that we're often scared of the persecution that we actually avoid it so much sometimes. Um, I think one of the greatest examples for me is sharing my faith. Right. Like one of the greatest reasons I don't share my faith is that I'm scared of being rejected by my friends and family. 100%. And I've experienced that. Yeah. I have. Yeah. Um, I remember trying to share with my brother and I, I don't think he said it directly, but it was, the words were as, basically shut up like <laughs> like he, he had a nicer way of putting it yeah. but um yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. um mm-hmm. it was a while ago so i don't know if he's i could try again but <laughs> <laughs> yeah I, I actually went home quite recently for after a long time and i right. didn't know how to be there and i fa- find myself falling into old habits it was weird oh, won't yeah. go into it yeah yeah, yeah, yeah yeah but i felt very other and i felt like I almost entered into their ways worse than if I, anyways. Yeah. 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 That happens a lot. Yeah. yeah. Um, is that, is that a good start? That to was great. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for that. Yeah. Time spent on that. No problem. Oh, it's, it's important. And, um, I think something we need to, to recognize, um, sorry, my computer's being weird, but there, hopefully that will solve it. Um, what is God's call in my life? Jesus tells us in Matthew 16, 24 to 26, and you said this out loud, which is great. Um, Those who want to follow me must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. This is a difficult call, but it is truly a good one. We're called to deny ourselves because we know our desires are not always in line with God. Whether we look at them in an absolute sense or even if we look at them in really specifics, Mm -hmm. they're so rarely in line with God. Mm -hmm. At moments, our desires might find themselves in a similar place as God's, you know, we can kind of say, you know, God wants us to love everyone. I've been there, you know, but when we really look at it, (laughs) we're not in the same place. His will is perfect. And as long as we hold on to something, it means we we aren't able to receive or live out his good at things, right? And so again, part of it is letting go. So we might take hold of him <laughs> or he might take hold of us. The next part is take up your cross. It means that each of us in this world has a particular burden. That's not an easy thing to realize that we all have something to take up. But we've already talked about a bit about how the burden taking it on with God actually means in some way a release unto itself. Um, there's a, a task and role that has made was made for us and we were made for. This will naturally bring with it a certain amount of suffering. It doesn't always mean the cross <laughs> where we are lucky to live in a world where mostly the biggest thing we'll experience is denying and rejection. Um, but our call is still really good you know it might be something like martin luther's king's cross or many others that have lived throughout society that have taken on that cross you know uh, mother Teresa. i'm just using huge examples but i love what mother Teresa says if you want to change the world go home and love your family Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. totally yeah start it where you are (laughs) and i've endured so much suffering Mm -hmm. more than Sometimes I can bear, mm-hmm. but I also think God's will for me is to be a cycle breaker. Mm. And there's been so 100%. much generational trauma yeah. in in so many generations back, 
And for some reason, I am chosen to be a barrier. And I think like I have such an empathic sense of maternal spirit mm -hmm. for purpose. Mm -hmm. That's huge. Uh, there's a lot more we could say on that, but yeah, that is huge. Um, there, of course, with all of this comes a certain denial of self, but that's really important because to approach God's great task for us, we must put ourselves under it or before it in order to follow. And if we know it comes with suffering, if we're putting ourselves first, we're not going to follow it mm -hmm. or we'll take it with little grasps, you know. But in all of this, following Christ is the essential part, right? That's the center of all of this. We can deny ourselves, we can suffer, but as long as we aren't following Christ, we will not be doing what is truly good in the world. He is the way, the truth, and the life. We utterly need him in our lives, to, and to follow him is the primary call. Mm -hmm. So, now I get to the handout that you have. Um, what is my purpose? Just a quick sum up of our purpose is really simple to be in relationship with God. That is our purpose. <laughs> but if we're perfectors of this, then we'd also be in perfect relationship with one another, ourselves and the world. That's why loving the, our neighbors is the natural consequence. Right. We'd be willing to serve, we would give, we'd love in such a way that no one would really go without. I once heard and it's a similar, uh, just a different way of saying this, but I once heard that we were meant for the two greatest commandments and the 10 commandments, which are sort of a natural outpouring of our relationship with God. The Bible has a lot more stuff in the broader relation of, to individuals and communal purpose. Um, but as you read it, even when you look at individuals purpose and the way God is trying to guide them, it can help us too, to see how God and where he's working. Um, the other thing to walk in tandem with that um, is to discern how God has already been moving in and around your life mm -hmm. and how he's been shaping you. So that gets in, now we're into sort of a discernment. How can I see what God has been doing in my life? So I've tried to give you a, a kind of um, practical way of starting to do this. Um, it was a practice I've been doing most of my life, honestly. And it was only um, when I went into seminary that I did it in a more holistic way and a very purposeful. Um, but I think my parents kind of taught it to me throughout my life without me realizing it because I was journaling and I was reflecting. And But so a sort of practical way is to journal. <laughs> um, journaling, I, I just find helpful. It doesn't work for everyone, but I would recommend trying it because it is, there's a physical act you do to accompany it. And that's an important thing to make your past present, <laughs> to make your experiences present and real. Um, they become more grounded when you write them. There's a non-dominant um, non handwriting journal exercise oh. that's so beautiful. Mm. And so you write like adult Katie, God writes, how are you Katie? And then with my non-dominant hand, I write and it's the unhealed parts of me, and it's mm. amazing what comes out. Mm. And then it's God responding back to that unhealed part. Mm. It's such a beautiful healing exercise. Mm. Yeah, it's lovely. Intense. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry. No, no that's okay. Thank you. That's great. That. Yeah. 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 It's not something I've ever done, but it sounds lovely. Um, in some way, that's a practical way of making your prayers present, and so it's great. Um, an important part that sort of accompanies this journaling is the growing in understanding of who God is, his character. Because as we do that, we're better to, at understanding and seeing where he shows up. Um, just the two best ways of sort of, of, of seeing where, three best ways of seeing where God shows up is the gospels. <laughs> well, scripture in general, but the gospels is the starting place because God became vis visibly present in a way where we could see him and know him. And relate to him easier. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But then the other time, the other two things, we've already talked about prayer, it's huge. Yeah. So that's just, you're building a relationship with God. 
But the answer, other one that we don't do as much in this church is testimonials. Mm -hmm. Is hearing where others have experienced and known God. Yeah. In some way, the Bible is just a consistent <laughs> testimonial um, that through history, people have recognized as true encounters with God. Um, but one note about this journal is it is different than a prayer journal. Mm -hmm. As much as prayer journals are also helpful, it is different. A prayer journal is where you write down your prayers. Um, and this can be part of your big journal because that's part of seeing what have you asked for and where is God showing up. But it's not the same thing. So with this journal, you'll see there's three, three parts that should be incorporated into it, which is looking back, looking present, and looking forward. So I've tried to sort of create a few practices that you can bring into your journaling uh, with each of them. So in the past, look out for places in which you have been directed more towards God. Those little moments in your life where you feel like you have been pulled towards him. And sometimes you don't see them in the moment and you have to look back and see, oh, God was introducing me to more to his love, towards mercy, whatever. Some of the biggest ones to start with are those big God moments, because those are often the easiest places to see him, where the miraculous or the seemingly unlikely in, uh, no consequences word. Uh, anyways, um, where things really seem unlikely to happen that needed to happen, happen. <laughs> um, but then there's a whole bunch of other things that God has been guiding in your life that you can start with that are easy to recognize, but then you can start to see why, why are those things important? So things like who are the heroes and the role models in your life? What are your greatest successes? What are your greatest failures? What are those life-changing moments and the, those life-changing moments don't actually have to be um, necessarily that they're always pointing you towards the good. They can also be pointing you towards the bad. And those are both important to recognize in tandem. There's also the gifts inventory. And I know we've been talking a little bit about that, but um, saying, uh, how have you blessed? And how have you been blessed? So what are your strengths? What are your weaknesses? What gifts have God given you? And how might those be used for the kingdom? Um, and also look at your suffering and your struggles. Because those are often points where we are either experiencing our own resistances or where we're experiencing resistance on the outside, sometimes in culture, sometimes from God. And so it's important to know and discern where is the struggle coming from? Uh, present. Reflect on what you have been experiencing. What God could be doing in that right now to strengthen, inspire, or correct you. What is he doing right now? And how is that guiding you? Um, who has he been bringing into your life? And this is important to look at in two ways. First, who has he been bringing in your life that is serving you, that is helping to guide you? But then who is he bringing in your life that you too might help to guide and serve and lift up? Same thing with people. What situations or places has God put you in? So it might be home, it might be community, it might be work. And how can God's kingdom grow in that place? There's some other big ones. What, what have you been learning? What have you been led to in prayer? Hmm. What common themes or things are coming up? This is more like intellectual sort of ways God has been guiding you. There's an interesting practice of, as you get to know the Bible more, is who are you, who do you feel like you relate to right now? Sometimes you feel like you relate to Job. <laughs> Sometimes you'll feel like you relate to Peter. Yeah. Sometimes you'll feel like you relate to David or mm. um, yeah. any number. But to find your story there, reflect on it. So yeah. many people. 
Yeah, it's totally. No, oh, yeah. <laughs> well, and and the, the beauty of the Bible is is that it's within the great grandeur of it, there is the human experience. And we can find someone. Hard part is we just might not always know. Yeah. Um, yeah. The, I found watching The Chosen. Really, oh, yeah. So good. Oh, yeah. really helped me see that they're all just a bunch of messed up people. <laughs> totally. Oh, yeah. Young people, too. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, man. Yeah. There's one last exercise that I just want to talk about quickly because it's one that I've known has been really helpful for many people. Um, yeah. There's an Ignatian exercise uh, that is called desolation and consolation. Um, the idea is that you reflect at the end of your day, you reflect back on your day or your week and see what things have led you closer to God and what things have led you further away and realize how that has led to consolation, which is closeness with God, which is closeness to all the good things. And that further away, which leads to desolation, which leads to those feelings of heaviness and loss and Guilt. distance. Sorry? Guilt. Guilt. Oh, totally. Yeah. If you want to look it up more, there, I haven't gone into all the detail. But... I get a lot of survivor guilt. Yeah, uh, totally. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like, I don't deserve good things. Yeah. 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 It's also important to look at the future, though. So what passions or dreams has God placed in your heart? Hard part to ask that is, are they from God? <laughs> Right. And the biggest way to sort of determine that is, is are those passions leading clo you closer to him and leading others with you closer to him? Mm -hmm. Even within that, they might not be currently. So there's another question you can ask is, how could your dreams and passions live into God's hope for you, humanity in the world? So they might just, you know, it might be a small, minute trajectory change. But oftentimes God has planted a, in us passions and joys that he wants to use. I keep hearing about this movie, Chariots of Fire. Oh, yeah. I haven't seen it. Oh, it's great. Yeah. Yeah, it's about these two runners. Mm -hmm. And essentially one is it's running. It's a movie, isn't it? Yeah, very old. Yeah, yeah. One, is, one of the runners is Christian. It's how does he practice his Christianity in the midst of right, it. And it's right. How can running be... A passion that God mm -hmm. is placing in heart to fulfill His totally, yeah. yeah, yeah. I fell asleep in it, I'll uh, admit. But even what I saw was like yeah. <laughs> what I remember is, yeah, yeah. Part of my childhood trauma running. Oh, really? oh wait, I was right. on a Canadian. Uh, um, I was on a national track and field team. Wow. Mm. We used to travel all over the states. Yeah, and I had seven knee operations from eleven to eighteen. Oh. from too much, too young. Oh, well, my gosh. brother had the Canadian record in the 1500, the 800. I had the Canadian record in the 1500 meters speed walking. And I only did it to <laughs> get a, a fourth medal. But yeah. oh. was, uh, I'm talking about like all yeah, under the age intense. of 12. Like it was ridiculous. Wow. What we did. Let's yeah. push these to her. Mm -hmm. There's a time and a place and we don't always realize. <laughs> Um, the other thing is to realize about our future is it's not just about dreams. It's also what fears are we holding on to? because that yeah. just can show so shape how we look at the future yeah. um how do they get in the way of you living out god's hope and living out faithfully i have such a fear of the rug being pulled out from under mm. like this is all just a make-believe and suddenly the reality is going to set in and it's all been mm. a lie mm. yeah i hear that yeah and the the harder part is that as we grow in our faith uh, we get more dependent <laughs> on it, but we also can begin to realize that it's more than just a rug, <laughs> right? It's, I find great comfort in listening to God uh, tell me that I'm right where I'm supposed to be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm believing. Mm -hmm. It's new for me. Mm -hmm. yeah. There's a lot of, um, to be able to just rest and enjoy where I am, without having these high standards that I have to do all this to deserve to be where I am. Mm -hmm. right. There's a big relief in that. Mm -hmm. yeah. That directly gets to the the last one part of that is what would it change if you had faith that God was leading all things in your life for good? You can mm -hmm. relax. Yeah. 
Yeah. yeah. It's a whole different reality. Yeah. Um, so discerning this uh, life narrative with God will help you understand how God has been patiently affecting your life to point you towards his purpose for you. Do you have time if I tell you a bit of my story? Yes. Okay. Yes. So. Sorry, what time is it? It's 1.47. Yeah, good. Yeah, just like the bowling party at three. Good. Oh, nice. Okay. <laughs> so, it, like I said, I've done a lot of this and I still need to do more. But one of the big things that happened in my early childhood was that I lost my hearing completely. I was wearing, I had Q-tips in my ears and a child came up behind me and punctured both my eardrums. Um, and the interesting thing was that I actually forgot about all of this. For most of my life, I, I don't know if it was a trauma that I just ignored and forgot about, um, but it had been something that just sort of disappeared in my life. One day, not long ago, I had... Um, this was while I was still an actor, I had a dream where silence fell on the world and it felt so real that I couldn't help but write it down. Yeah. I happened to go to a, a, a film um, a pitch meeting and I was hoping that I could find a part as an actor. But I, I as people were speaking, I, the, the dream developed into a story and so I shared it and people were so excited about it, they wanted me to produce a film about it, <laughs> to write it and produce it. And so I started telling it and through this, God led me to keep telling the story and keep telling the story until one day I'm being interviewed for it and it suddenly clicks and I said, it came from an actual experience. Mm -hmm. I, and it was weird because I suddenly came to this realization and I, so I call my parents and they tell me the story and they tell me how, wow. how uh, I went into the doc, I go into the hearing doctor like, every few months and every time I went in the doctor would say your child has about a 50 50 chance he will regain any hearing any hearing the only hope we have the only reason it's 50 50 is because he's so young mm -hmm. um, if he was five years older 10 years older I'd give you a 98 percent you know and I'd come in a few months later and I would have regained some hearing just a little bit mm -hmm. And then the doctor would say the same thing, 50-50 chance. And again and again and again, I just kept regaining hearing. And it took supposedly about a year and a half until I regained all of my hearing. Now, if you acquire all that, you know, 50-50 chances, what is the actual likelihood of all of that? Right. It's immense. But after that, I started looking back on my life and seeing how my voice and my hearing has been so essential to who I am, mm -hmm. to how I relate to others, to how I share stories, to how I love music, to how I love storytelling and listening to stories that if I didn't have, my life would have been drastically different. And so there's this slow work of sort of realizing that God had a purpose for that healing. <laughs> had a purpose for giving me something that I didn't deserve. Um, and so that led me actually to here to some degree is the big question of, okay, God, you have given me so much. How do I give it back to you? Why are you saying you don't deserve? Oh, cause I was, it was in some ways my fault that I lost my hearing. It was a pure gift. <laughs> No, it was like, yes, there was the stupidity of the child, but, <laughs> but I was stupid too. Who, who goes around with Q-tips in their ears running around the playground? You're just <laughs> asking for, you know, if I could have tripped. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Like if any adult looked at me, they would have been like, stop it. <laughs> <laughs> no, totally. Okay. Mm -hmm. But yeah, nonetheless, yeah. God just gave it to me. And there's so many things that God had given me that I kept looking back and seeing them as immense gifts. You know, I was bullied like I talked about, but my parents were such a strong foundation for me that it didn't matter. I knew love and I could share it. So that love consisted out there. Mm. And so even when my parents got divorced, 
I realized that there was this strong love that overcame even that. That like that brokenness, that loss, that bullying didn't need to be the love I rested in. <laughs> there was something so much more grounded and full that I could live into and change lives. Um, I, throughout most of my life, the church has been a sanctuary for me. You know, whether it's times where I've been bullied, while I didn't fit in, when I've been coming to another country, like I traveled in Australia on my own and often alone, quite literally. Um, and I find there are people that didn't know me willing to open up their doors, invite me in. And it was just amazing. And I consistently find this family bigger. And so part of my purpose and part of what I say every Sunday is we are a family and I want to create that and embrace people in the way that I have experienced. Um, I've experienced people that patiently listen to me, um, that have offered opportunities, that have shared their faith. And so I'm still scared sometimes, but I want to live into that same thing I've experienced. Um, one of the biggest things that shaped my life was uh, a pilgrimage across Spain. And this has been um, one of my biggest strong strengthenings in my life. Um, because I did it when I was 14 and I came face to face with my weakness numerous times. And I couldn't do it on my own. Um, uh, there's one story I'll, I'll, I'll share. This is, this is the... Um, the footsteps. I'll try to shorten it. Um, so when I was walking, I'd, I'd walk on my own. My parents were very kind and trusting to let a 14 year old walk in Spain without the cell phone, you know. Um, they'd tell me I'd earned it, but that's another story. Um, but there's one day where I was walking and I felt my legs getting heavier and heavier. And it just kept getting worse and worse as time went on. And eventually I couldn't stand. My legs got so heavy that I couldn't stand. So I just sat down and I told myself, you know, that I just need to drink water. I just need to breathe. I need a bit of rejuvenation, right? I've been working too hard. Um, I was literally walking through a desert and there's mountains surrounding it, like a rocky desert. Mm. So I'm sitting on the side of the road um, and I'm, just trying to take care of my body, that sort of thing. And it felt like an eternity, but I try to get up and I can't, I can't get up. I keep trying to stand and I stand and I stand and eventually I'm getting so fed up with it. And I'm like, okay, I just need to get to my feet. And if I can be on my feet, then I can walk. So I put all of my gusto into like my hands and my feet just to get to my feet. And I fall flat on my face. <laughs> And at this point, I have nothing left. And I turn to God and I just start praying and I close my eyes and I say, God, I need you. I need you, God. I can't do this on my own. I need you. Please help me. I need you. And I just keep repeating. And again, it feels like an eternity, but for a moment, I feel like he's not there. And I'm scared and terrified because I, I just don't know where he is. And I feel like I've been left on my own. And then I open my eyes and I see that I'm walking. And I can't make sense of it because I, I feel my legs moving, but it feels like there's no effort. Mm. And I'm watching myself and it's it, it, like the biggest thing I can say, it's like walking in clouds or something. Like mm. it felt like someone else was moving for me, but I was still doing it too. And I get all the way to the, the hostel. I fall asleep there and I sleep for 16 hours <laughs> and I wake up and it felt like nothing happened. Uh. <laughs> I felt that I was completely rejuvenated. Mm. Um, yeah. And so I, I constantly turn back to that moment and I see it's in my greatest need when I experience God in the greatest way, when I was most open. Such a formative time in your life too. Oh, totally. Yeah. Oh yeah. And that only gave me strength for high school. Mm -hmm. Like that was a huge formative. So every time I had a question, you know, it wasn't that I had an answer. It was at least that I had a, I knew someone was guiding me along the way. Mm -hmm. There's plenty of other things that happen in that walk. You meet people that are going through everything and they mm -hmm. share their stories with you. And so you experience mm -hmm. people going through divorce and yeah. Anyways, you yeah. really experience the gambit of life mm -hmm. in this 35 day walk. 
That's so hard. Yeah. Anyways, but um, and then on top of that, my relationship with Marianne has been a big learning curve for me too, um, because I could exist to some point separate <laughs> for a long time, and I kind of did exist that way. If I'm to become completely honest with mo most of my life, um, I had good friends, but I didn't. I never felt like I had great friends. Um, a few, maybe, but. Um, my relationship with Marianne kind of really changed that and really forced me to open my heart. And that actually changed, forced me to sort of open up my heart to God more too. Mm. Um, and there is a way in which I was sort of rebelling against God in that phase. And uh, I found my sort of calling back because I knew I needed, if, if this relationship was to be anything, um, I needed him in it too. And so it became a, a sort of cyclical um, way in which I experienced my need and experienced the grace <laughs> um, consistently with God and with Marianne. And I was very blessed to experience her graciousness because mm -hmm. I wasn't always great and I'm still not always great. <laughs> um, yeah. So that's that's a bit of my story. I, there's tons more I could share, but those are some of the Thanks, most yeah. pivotal. Yeah. Thank you. There, Thank you. Yeah. Um, we're almost done, right? No, we're not. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let me just, uh, what is the meaning of life? This is one of the big questions you'll get in the world, but it's really simple to have it. <laughs> to know life, to truly live it, and to sh truly share it, too. To live it. Yeah, yeah. to yeah. live it. Yeah. Be present. <laughs> totally. Yeah. And since we know we are born and live in this world, it also means living with others, right? But we also know that to know life is to know and live with the very source of life. And so we only grow in our knowing how to live our life through knowing the one that gave it to us. But just because a lot of people think this, life is not some great big test that we need to somehow prove ourselves to be good enough. That's not the way it is. Sure, there are tests sometimes, but the truth of those tests is that like all life, it is a choice. It's not a test, <laughs> a choice for you to say, are you willing to choose life or your own way? It's put numerous ways throughout scripture. Are you willing to choose life or death? Are you willing to choose blessings or curses? It's the same choice that was faced, that faced Adam and Eve. Do you choose the fruit of eternal life or do you choose the fruit which says, I want to be independent from God. Mm -hmm. I want my way. Mm -hmm. I want to know everything and live on my terms. We it's may almost yeah. saying that you don't trust God. Mm -hmm. And saying we don't trust life. Right. Like yeah. just think about the garden. There was this great bounty. They had been given everything. And they already lived in it for a while. Hard to know how long. But <laughs> They don't trust what is right there in front of them. Mm -hmm. We make this choice again and again, every single day. Are we going to trust life? Every moment. Yeah. <laughs> we, we make this choice when we say what we want, what, with everything that we say, with everything that we do, with everything that we think. And if we grow with Christ, we will actually be producing the fruit of eternal life. It won't just live in us, but we'll also see it come out too. And so we will be presenting and planting the seeds for eternal life that we know the world needs. Mm. And so just a way of sort of expressing this life is that we are all the church to the world. We are all Christ in the world. Um, in each of our relationships. Just think about it. They might never actually know what life is unless they see it and meet it in you. You are the light of the world. Totally. The city on the hill. Yeah, the salt of the earth. Mm. 
um, we can all tend life at one stage or another. So if you think about just planting in this, you might plant a seed, you might water, you might prune, you might harvest. But the important part <laughs> is that, again, this doesn't feel like a burden. Because we must trust that God is doing the growing. Right? What Paul says to us. We're also confessors in that we confess our faith. And we've already mentioned the priesthood of all believers. Those are just other ways of exploring what it means to actually live. But is a common question that comes with this is, uh, because it often feels like very big, <laughs> how do we increase in faith? You might remember what Jesus says. If you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you can, you can tell this mountain to fall into the sea. You can tell this plant to uproot itself. But it's like, I don't know, this, I feel like, I feel bullied by this statement. <laughs> like, I, are me... you telling me my faith is not so small because I'm telling the mountain it's not moving? <laughs> you know, like, no, really, like, if, have, if it's like, as if in this statement, I'm told you're not good enough, your faith is not strong enough. And I'm like, I think my faith is pretty good, you know? Mm -hmm. Totally. But what is faith? I kind of look at this as the same analogy as as uh, being part of the body. Mm -hmm. That it's a big hand. That it's mm -hmm. not all on me. Mm -hmm. So it's like it comes down to me like humility. Mm -hmm. And you know, if he's talking about the mustard seed as it's not an insult. It's meaning that it's a big hand, and we're only mm -hmm. meant to do our part. Mm -hmm. Hmm. How did you? Can you tell me? So, about like, it? it's like me being an eye of a whole body, me being mm -hmm. me being a liver of a whole body. It's like it's about the the hoop that you have to jump through is larger than you think, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, that it's it doesn't have to be so hard. We put so much pressure on ourselves to do things i i know for myself i just put the standard too mm, high yeah, mm -hmm. and when i just surrender and it's not all on me yeah. i can relax in it mm -hmm. yeah. yeah yeah well if, if we just take what faith is for a second faith is trusting that god is going to enter in and do something mm -hmm. and so you know if we are telling this mountain in faith. Faith is part of the trusting that it might not happen right now. It might not happen tomorrow. But God's going to do something <laughs> about it. There's... Um, oh, maybe that's why there was an earthquake. Because I just saw that mountain. <laughs> or it might mean that, you know, God is, is seeing what the mountain for you actually is. Mm -hmm. And how he might work on that. It might be stones at a time, but one of... One of the best examples I can see of this is um, there's this sort of new practice in the Anglican church. Um, I can't remember what it's called, but just around Lent, um, or it's Easter, um, there's this call to pray for five people every day that don't know Jesus. Mm. It comes from this one man that uh, prayed for a hundred people his whole life. Same hundred same people every day his whole life. Mm. He never saw the fruits of it, but at his funeral, if I remember the story right, this might be a little off, but if I remember correctly, they found that list and 97 out of the 100 had become Christian. Wow. Like that seems impossible to me. <laughs> <laughs> like I know my own friend group, <laughs> but... I might be missing, mixing up the story a little bit. He might not have died. He might have, anyways. It might have been less than 97, but it was pretty high. <laughs> um, for me, prayer changes me. Mm -hmm, so when right. I pray for people that I'm resent, resentful towards or that are sick and suffering, I'm softening my experience mm -hmm. to move forward with them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like I pray often for my identical twin. Mm -hmm. In active addiction, mm. major mental health issues, and when I 
So when I am encountering her, I have better boundaries, but I'm not, it's like prayer changes me. So yeah. the forgiveness is for my peace and it's a ripple effect. Mm -hmm. It's a ripple yeah. effect to how I engage with the sick. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it, prayer is doing many things. <laughs> so there is definitely the internal part. And just consistent prayer is about coming closer to God. And that everything we offer to God is inviting him to come into it. And so there is a lot of natural personalness that changes. But we must also trust that his Holy Spirit is doing something in it too. Mm -hmm. Because he responds. He does. And even sometimes we can hear that God changes his will through our prayer. And that's pretty phenomenal. But... The other parts, and this this is actually where I meant to start, but I, that faith is not a set, just a set of beliefs. Faith and faith is not first our action. We are given the faithfulness of Christ. And that's a really important place to start. Because if it's just our faith, we know we've fallen short a hundred thousand times, but we know Christ's faith hasn't. And so we are actually given his faith and he wants to give us his faith more and more that we can, ex so we can accept it and live into it. And so faith is actually a trust that God is faithful. It starts there. It is seeing and understanding what God in the Father and Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit has done for us, and then understand that it is shaping us and it is pointing the way forward. Right. So our faith starts with Christ's faith. And so in a weird way, that immense faith has already been given to us. You just have to take hold and grasp it. Mm. Yeah. It's already there. The mustard seed's already in us. We just have to yeah. see it and remember it's there and totally. look to it more and more. Yeah. There's nothing for us to do outside of just recognize that we already have it. Yeah. 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 Because if we really see that God is immensely faithful, if we really trust that, our faith is just natural. Right. It's a consequence. Yeah. So we just look inside ourselves. Look inside ourselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and our past and, and everything that, yeah. Um, and I think that's part of that mustard seed faith. <laughs> Is it's recognized that we've already been given it. That it already can grow and thrive in us. It, again, harder <laughs> said than done. This is, And we're not meant to guilt ourselves for not doing it. Mm -hmm. But just recognize that it is there for us to grasp. Mm -hmm. And at any moment, we can turn to it and live into it. Um, what is all of this for? And this is a sort of important sort of wrapping up of the whole thing. Um, because we experience both sides, right? We experience both the immense bounty and the joy, but we also experience the brokenness. So what all of this is for isn't again that test or anything like that. It's simply a result of God loving you. He loves you particularly with all that you are. So much so that he isn't going to force you into anything. He's not going to force you to love him as much as he longs for. Or for you to experience his love as much as he longs for. And said he wants you to freely choose him. He so desires to have such a strong relationship with you, and he knows that that is what you need and what is good for you. So, of course, that often leads to hardship, to him actually showing us where the edges are so that he might guide us back. That is where the greatest struggle actually comes, <laughs> is when we meet the edges of where we need to be directed back. Or when others experience it and retaliate. But that's another thing. Then he wants you to grow in that relationship. So he wants you to understand him more and more so that you re might receive him more and more. So the edges might become a little narrower, so to speak, as he guides us into his blessings. 
that when we commit to God in faith, repent and are baptized, God makes us his child, that we are bound to him for our good, which means that something so fundamental to who we are, like our very blood, has been changed, has been formed and ties us to him. This means that as we grow in faith, we are shaped more and more to be like him, like our father into the image of Christ. We grow in this life changing maturity, which is spiritual, physical, mental. We're blessed by this re reality right away, but we continue to grow into it too. Beautiful thing is as we become his children, we also become heirs. Meaning that this great infinite bounty of God is given to us. But first through the father, because we haven't inherited it yet, so to speak. But also, we know it shall be ours too. Meaning that we will become so much than what we are, both in this life and in the life to come. I just want to cl close with a quote from C.S. Lewis um, in The Weight of Glory. Mm -hmm. It is a serious thing to live in a society of possible gods and goddesses. To remember that the dullest, most uninteresting person you can talk to may one day be a creature which, if you saw it now, you would be strongly tempted to worship. Or else a horror and a corrupt corruption such as you now meet, if at all, only in a nightmare. All day long, we are in some degree helping each other to one or the other of these destinations. It is in light of these overwhelming possibilities. It is with the awe and circumspection proper to them that we should conduct all our dealings with one another, all friendships, all loves, all play, all politics. There are no ordinary people. You have never talked to a mere mortal. Nations, cultures, art, arts, civilizations, these are mortal. And their life is to ours as the life of a gnat. But it is immortals whom we joke with, work with, marry, snub, and exploit. Immortal horrors or everlasting splendors. Mm -hmm. Amen. <laughs> Can we just pray, close by praying? Yes. Lord God, we thank you for the amazing potential you have planted in each and every one of us. As we face this immensity and this glory and this bounty, we pray, pray, Lord, that it never will become a burden. That we might rest in you, that we might find the purpose that fits, that we might trust in you and follow you in the midst of it. That we might so trust you that when suffering or struggles come, we know your hope. And that we might be shaped into your character. We might have perseverance. <coughs> Lord God, may we move out in this world as your children, as your image bearers, sharing and living into your bounty so that more and more people might know theirs too. Lord God, may we know your faith so that we too might live into it. Amen. 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 Amen.